God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his Stones. He is building a place he can live Break after break Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the word of God this morning And we are reading a familiar passage found in Genesis, the second chapter reading from the New International Version. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man had given names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. My subject this morning, help needed. Help needed needed. We're all familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. And unfortunately for many, it's become somewhat too familiar. And it is often thought of something of a myth, maybe symbolic, maybe one step above a fairy tale, a fantastic story that for many just find it hard to believe, something naive that the ancient world told each other to attempt to explain the world in which they live. We Bible believers don't necessarily hold to that worldview. But I'd like to take a look at this familiar story and perhaps pull out some practical insights for us today. The name Adam comes from the Hebrew word which means man. The Hebrew word Ben Adam is a word for son of man a recognizable and preferred title of Jesus Christ. Adam, or the man, is often used as a representative of all of mankind. So when the scriptures speak of Adam, yes, it speaks of an individual. But it goes beyond that many times because he represents 
you and I. We see this clearly in Paul's writings of Corinthians. There, the scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. It's interesting in verse 47, one translation reads that Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man. In another translation, the first Adam made from the earth came from the earth. The second Adam came from heaven. So Adam and man are often used interchangeably. And Jesus is referred to as the second man or the second Adam. So Adam would represent much of mankind as church represents his people, the first of a new group of people. In this story, one of the things that should come to know, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. God designed a place, a specific place, and then put the man in that place. Where you are can be just as important as who you are. In the story, one of the principles of life comes out, and that is it matters where you are. It matters your, your environment, the people you hang around with, the people that you choose to have in your life. Make a difference. They matter. Paul speaks of this. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. This principle, this very vital and important principle, is clearly illustrated in the life of the prophet Elijah. One of the most powerful prophets spoken of throughout the Bible in the Old and New Testament. In his journeys, we would read, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Kerioth, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So understand what he's saying to Elijah. Get from here and go there. But why did he have to do that? Why couldn't God feed Elijah and provide for Elijah where he was? Well, certainly he could have done that. But often God designed the place that you need to be in order to receive all that God has for you. In Elijah's case, he needed to get from there and go to another place. And there he would drink from a brook and he would be fed by ravens, which is Rather strange to begin with because ravens are not exactly clean birds. Why would you want to be fed by wild scavenous birds? God's place for you may not always be your choice. It may not be your first idea. It may not be your plan. 
He tells them to go to a brook and drink from the brook. And it says, as it happened after a while, that brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. See what happens here. God tells them to go to a brook and drink there. But after a while, the brook that God sent them to dried up. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. It doesn't have to be a bad place for it to be the wrong place. So now the brook dries up. The very brook that God told him to go to is no longer a place of provision. As the story goes on, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So once again, leave here and go there. Are you in the place that God has designed for you in order to give you everything that you need? Let's get back to our story. So God planted a garden and he put Adam in that place. God said it is not good for man to be alone. I've always was fascinated with this statement because the first thing that God said was not good was loneliness. Loneliness is the first thing that God named as not good. Now, this was before sin. And I remember questioning God and saying, now you created the world and there's something that's not good. So my question to the Lord is, how did you miss this? But then he let me know. He didn't miss it. You see, man was created in the image of God. And God doesn't need anybody else. God doesn't need anyone to lean on. He doesn't need anyone to advise him. Because he's God all by himself. Well, hallelujah, I get happy about this stuff. So it wasn't a mistake that Adam was designed in this fashion. And what we find is because he's in God's image, God doesn't have to go outside to fix this. What Adam needed was already inside him. It only took God to pull it out. Hallelujah. And so God provides a helper. Now, it says here, I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. If you would note, it wasn't Adam who realized he needed help. It was God who recognized he needed help. You may not always realize you need the help that you really need. So Adam now is in this state and he needs help. And it wasn't until the wife came that was the answer to his help. It might be said that the man before the wife came was helpless. I see some of you ladies enjoying this just a little too much. So Adam needs help and God sends him the help 
that he needs. Now, take note that there's a couple of things that happen before God sends Eve. First, we read, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Important note, before the man was given a wife, he had a job. <laughs> Brothers, if you don't have a job, you don't need to be looking for no wife. <laughs> oh, I'm preaching hard now. The next thing to note, so the Lord God caused a man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. He put his flesh to sleep and then gave him a wife. If you are in the flesh, you don't need to be looking for a wife. You don't need your hormones driving you to find a wife. So God got his flesh out of the way and he had a job and God gave him the wife. The other thing about putting Adam to sleep was Adam had nothing to do with this situation now. Adam had no say so in the help that God was providing him. I will make a helper suitable for him. If we can only get out of our way and allow God to give us what we need without our interference, without our input, what a powerful people we would be. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's how you get the help that you need. That's how you get your blessing. That's how you discover the will of God for your life. When you're like Jesus and say, not my will, but your will be done. That's why one of the best prayers, the most effective prayers you could ever make is simply help, Lord. Lord, help me. We like to approach God with our fix-it list. Give me this. Get rid of him. But if we just go empty-handed and say, Lord, you know, help me. You give me what you know I need. In the Old Testament, there was a king, King Asa. King Asa started out as a pretty good king. He went off the rails later in his life, but he started as a good king. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the asterisk poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. Things are going good for King Asa and the people. An army then approaches him. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely 
on you. And in your name, we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. Don't wait for trouble to come before you recognize you need help from God. Don't wait till you hit bottom before you cry out, God help me. Don't wait till you mess up royally before you go to God and ask for help. Approach him knowing that he is the God to give you everything that you need. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Know who your God is. Learn to rely on Jesus Christ to provide you with all the help that you need. Now, there's also a significant difference between the source and the resource. You see, when the mailman, the UPS guy brings you a package, that's a resource. That's not the source. The source is the originator of the package. The delivery boy is the resource. He is the tool used by the source to get you what you need. Always be thankful for your resources, but never forget who the true source is. It's good if you have a church that supports you. It's good if you have family members that you can rely on, friends that you can lean on, but that's not your source. That's the resource. The preacher can bring you a message that would lift you up and encourage you and advance you forward, but that's not the source. That's the resource. That's the person, the people that God uses to get you the help. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. David said, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. You see, because resources can dry up. Resources can let you down. Resources can make mistakes. And David experienced this. He realized with all the people that he had in his life, there were times when he was not able to count on his friends. When people who he thought were in his corner let him down. So he learned, he said, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I'm here to tell you that dark times may come and you'll find yourself in need. You'll find yourself hurting and you're looking for help. And it's good if you have people that you can go to, but understand that your true help has to come from God. You might call me, I might not always be around. You may look to lean on somebody and they have their own problems. Oh, hallelujah, but if you lean on God and know that you have somebody who will never let you down, I can call on him no matter how late or early in the morning and know that he's always there. He'll never tell me he's too busy. He'll never turn me away. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. 
all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Know where your help comes from. And when you're down and when you're up against the wall and you have nowhere else to go and you don't know which way to turn, know that God is there and he'll reach down and he'll send you the help you need. He'll send you your healing. He'll send you your blessings. He'll lift you up. He'll encourage you on. Thank God I have a helper. Let Jesus help you. Let Jesus help you. Let Jesus help you. Break after brick, God is building his temple. Break after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones.